Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Elena, and I run events at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Salma Awadani's debut album, album, novel, <laughs> These Impossible Things, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors, and writers, we wouldn't be here today. We are thrilled to have Salma with us for a discussion of her novel, These Impossible Things. Sama Awadani is a writer, poet, and BBC broadcaster. As a half Egyptian, half Irish woman, her work focuses on telling the stories of women, especially women of color, that have for so long been ignored. She has contributed to the anthology It's Not About the Burka, and her writing has appeared in Huffington Post, the Metro, and she has given two TED Talks. Joining Sama in conversation is Mona El -Tawe. Mona is the founder and editor in chief of the newsletter Feminist Giant. She's a public speaker on global feminism and is the author of Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution, which targeted the patriarchy in the Middle East and North Africa, and the seven, necess seven necessary sins for women and girls, which took her disruption to the patriarchy worldwide. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sama and Mona to the stage. Hello, everyone. Um, I begin everything as I always do by telling you that my name is Mona Altahawi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I start, as I always do, with my declaration of faith, fuck the patriarchy. And there are few people who I would rather yell and chant that with than our wonderful, wonderful author today, Salma. Salma, welcome. Thank you, my darling. It is so good to be here shouting at the patriarchy with you again. <laughs> wonderful. We will tell people about the other time we did. But I do think that you are going to read us um, an excerpt from your wonderful novel. Yes, let's let's start with that. I have got um, a section here. I'm sure you know this. It's always hard to pick a section because I don't want to spoil it if people haven't read it. So I've tried to pick one that's not going to give too many spoilers, but it is from towards the end. And it's from the perspective of, of one of our characters. And I've got a few pages here. So let me see what we can we can get through. OK, so this starts with the perspective of our character, Jenna. 4.15 in the morning, and Jenna's eyes have just opened. She's in the split second between a dream and all that is true, a foot in both worlds. The same dream has been visiting her sporadically for months, but lately it comes more often. It's full of fuzzy details and nameless people, but the one thing she knows is that she's killed someone. She can hear the sirens coming for her as she tries to hide the body, and she always wakes just before she's caught, the clatter of her heart beating too fast against her chest, the only sound in the house. She lies staring at the ceiling, her body still trembling slightly, safe in a king-size bed with too much space around it and nobody to roll over to. The light coming through the open windows tells her that it's too early to start the day. She tries to fall back asleep, but her eyes keep popping open, her body wrestling with itself between the sheets. She considers going for a run, but it's still too early. Running at 4 a.m. makes you a crazy person. Running at 5 a.m. means you're dedicated. And she has 45 minutes before her actions are seen as inspirational rather than deranged. She can't bear the glare of a screen, so doesn't pick up her phone or put a movie on. Just lies in bed watching the light change through the open window. At 4.57, she rolls out of bed and pulls on her leggings, wrapping a white cotton scarf around her head, covering her hair. She leaves a note for her parents in the kitchen and quietly leaves the house, breathing a sigh of relief that her body can now move. For an hour, she runs, only stopping on three occasions and never to catch her breath. She pushes her body to its limits and then asks a little more of it. By the time she circles back home and pushes the front door open, the house is awake and loud, and she's completed 15 kilometers. Shouts her dad across the breakfast table, gesturing to the food piled in front of him. Your mother has cooked a feast. Yalla, come join me. Good morning, Baba, Jenna replies, unable to resist smiling back in the face of his joy, which is even more delightful for having no apparent reason. I'm going to shower and then I'll be down. Morning, Mama. Good morning, my darling, her mother shouts back over her shoulder, concentrating on cracking six eggs into the shakshuka, which is filling the kitchen with the scent of roasted tomatoes and cumin. 
She smiles at them both and remembers a time when there was nothing she wanted more than to be in the heart of her parents' happiness. She gets in the shower and cries. She doesn't know why. Now that daylight has arrived, she can see the boxes piled up around her room. A stack of papers, booklets, HR documents and staff guidelines are piled on her desk. The welcome papers of her new job that will start in three weeks. Her wedding dress is hanging in the guest room. She's glad she doesn't have to look at it. What started as an inability to focus on wedding plans due to exams has turned into, you decide, I trust you. Her mother looks at her strangely when she says this, and then Jenna knows to comment on how much she loves Mo, and her mother smiles and squeezes her hand, the worry clouding her eyes dissipating. Everything feels far away and out of reach to Jenna. A chain of beautiful things happening, but she's unable to feel them. A few weeks ago, Mo had taken her for a drive to the coast. I know it's not the same as the beach in Egypt that your friend took you to, but you keep talking about how great it was to be by the sea. So I thought I'd bring you here, he had said. Looking at her with so much love in his eyes, she felt horrible for being distant. She then did something she had never done with him. Stepping up to him, putting her hands on both sides of his face and pulling him in to kiss him. She had put everything she had learned from kissing men and women over the years into that kiss. And by the time she was finished, he looked at her, blinking in shock. For a moment, she thought that maybe she'd done the wrong thing. For the entirety of their relationship, she had only kissed him back when he reached for her, which he rarely did. There were lines not crossed, and Mo was a man who always did the right thing. He was a man raised by a woman who talks more to God than to her husband, and who has raised four sons to hold open doors and hold themselves back from women, unless that woman is your wife. Jenna has never asked, but she would bet her father's fortune that all the women Mo has been with are white and not Muslim. She knows this because all the men she has been with are not Muslim. And there's an unspoken agreement that if you're going to break the rules, don't do it with one of your own. People talk. And I shall leave it right there. Thank you, Salma. Virtual clapping for you. I wish we were doing this in person because I know you would get a good round of applause there. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you for writing this book, because, you know, as those last few sentences in the extract that you just read, you know, make clear, this is not a book I've read before. You know, these are like <laughs> the kind of stories that we would talk about, you know, amongst ourselves, but rarely actually speak out loud. So tell me, was there a moment where you were like, fuck this shit, I need to write this down? Or what, what made you think I need to write this novel? I think for me, a lot, which I'm sure is something you're going to resonate with, Ramona, but a lot of my work comes from anger. And when I'm really pissed off, that's when I will, will write something. And when I was at university, I did my master's thesis on literature and I did it on the representation of Muslims within literature. And for 12 months, I searched high and low across countries and continents to find literature that spoke about Muslims and people that look like you and I and, and people of color and Arab women. And unfailingly, they fell into three groups. And that was, you know, the terrorist, that was the Aladdin trope. So we all lived in the desert and were the sixth wife of a Sultan, um, or the, the emancipated uh, character in which we'd been saved from the shackles of an oppressive culture and an oppressive religion. And the West had in all its glory, like a knight in shining armor saved us. But it just, pissed me off and I remember looking at me and all my friends and thinking well it's not this isn't us this isn't any of us we loved our cultures and our faith and we loved belonging to the countries that we were born and raised in and everything enriched us and nothing deprived us um and yet no one was saying that no one was talking about the majority of Muslim Arab women who are a majority as well not we're not a small small um part of the population who just didn't exist outside these terrible groups um mm -hmm. and so I thought there's that Tony Morrison quote that if there's a book that you want to read then and it's not out there then you should write it so I thought well I was always going to be a writer I had better start with this one mm -hmm. and I'm so glad you did because you know uh, alongside the tropes that you mentioned and um it's especially brutal on us as women because you know I, I think of for example you know shows like Rami and others where we're finally seen, and Mo now, the, the kind of the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the recent Palestinian American show on, on Netflix, right? So you've got A24's Rami, Netflix's Mo. 
And while I celebrate those shows because they complicate the narratives, it's about men. They center right. the men. And I'm like, where is the show about Rami's sister? Because I want to see her life, you know? Right. And Mo's sister, you know, she marries a white guy and we just barely see her. So what your book did is like, you went in between all those gaps and you're like, okay, okay, so you've let in a few of our brown men, right? But what about us brown women? Where are we? So it's like what Mindy Kalian has done with like, say, you know, the sex lives of college girls and never have I ever, your book has done and like with a kapow, right? Because it's like, it's not about the men, it's about us. Yeah, and when you think about Rami and Mo, that is such recent history. That is in like Mo was released last week, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about, you know, Minza men like back in the day when, when mm -hmm. we had those things and they were cultural touch points for us. There was nothing. We did not exist outside damning narratives. And, you know, the stories of women haven't been told by women for so long anyway, let alone brown women, let alone Arab women, let alone Muslim women. You know, there's so many frontiers to break down before you can get to that point. And I remember thinking this about, um, you know, when Modern Family came out in America mm -hmm. and they, pulled, they had done a poll recently before Modern Family came out about the attitudes to passing equality laws for gay marriage in America. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, still, it would, there was not a majority in favor. There were still mm -hmm. so many uh, people in America and across the States who did not want to see that become a reality mm -hmm. in their country. Mm -hmm. And then you had Modern Family, which came out and, you, and then similar shows which followed in the wake of it. Mm -hmm. And you had shows that weren't just focused on the fact that this person was LGBTQ+, but actually this person was dealing with the things that all of us dealt with every single day, the same troubles with family and career and love, but they just so happened to be a queer family or a gay family, whatever it was. And they popped after the release of that show and the release of the popularity of that show, and attitudes shifted enormously into a perception of what they felt was acceptable when it came to passing laws for, for marriage mm -hmm. equality. And that bit has always stuck with me because mm -hmm. we live in stories and we remember the world in stories and we make sense of the world in stories. And mm -hmm. if we are absent from those stories, mm -hmm. then we do not get to be part of the world in the way that we should. Mm -hmm. And so that always stuck with me. And I thought, well, okay, I just need to write us into popular mm -hmm. culture so that it's not mm -hmm. about the fact that we're brown or the fact that we're Muslim or Arab, mm -hmm. it's just the fact that we're like everyone else and we're dealing with all the same stuff. And we have mm -hmm. to be characters that have yeah. a huge sway of, of, of emotions, feelings and challenges. Yeah, absolutely. The most wonderful complication, which is why we were talking in you know, our virtual green room earlier, that you were one of the people that Nana Dako Sakaima spoke, spoke to for her wonderful book, The Sex Lives of African Women. And Nana was our guest in the, the, for the last uh, book club event. And um, you were one of the women that she spoke to who decided to use her own name. And I, I was so glad to see that. And Nana and I were talking about how she begins her book by saying that talking about pleasure is political. Talking about these taboo subjects is political. And so to take us into your book, we, you know, we, we will do the kind of like the big kind of mega picture again, because I want to talk to you about, you know, your other work um, besides the book. But taking that, talking about taboo subjects and talking about pleasure is political and, and it, it's a wonderful form of subversion. Let's get into, into your novel, which is a wonderful companion. So Nan, Nana's book is oral narratives, basically, of you know, women and people who identify as women or have been um, gendered as female um, on the continent of various um, sexual and, and gender backgrounds. And your book is like the, the novel kind of companion to it. So I hope people, you know, learn um, to read them both together. So we've got Malak, we've got Jenna, and we've got Peace, three young British Muslim women. Give us a bit of uh, kind of like what you would like people watching to know about these characters that, that you know, make them think, okay, I, I got to go read this book. Well, these characters, these three women, they've been friends since they were, were really young girls and they're navigating life and they're navigating coming into their womanhood together and what it means to be a woman for each and every one of them. And they belong to different cultural backgrounds. And what I would want, I guess, our listeners who are tuned in now to, to know about them is these women are hungry. They are 
bold and ambition. They have big desires and big passions and they're not afraid to go after them. They're just trying to navigate how they can get to them. It's a story about female friendship and how female friendships will save your life and the women in your life will will save you and pick you up um, off the bathroom floor many a times. Um, and I think for me, these three women are women who are fearlessly moving through the world, which doesn't mean that they don't have challenges or sadnesses or heartbreak, but mm. despite all of those things, mm. they are still staying true to what they want, regardless of the overwhelming chorus that the world will throw at women to say, this is what you should be, and this is how you should bend, and this is how you should mm. present. Regardless of all that noise, they are still going for their big, big hungry ambitions. Mm. Mm. And what I, I especially loved, you know, I love that you describe them as hungry and I love that you talk about their ambition and I love you, uh, the way you talk about how, you know, they're out there in the world, you know, taking all that they want um, and, and wanting more. And I love how they don't have to choose between all these aspects of themselves because, there's no choice here. You know, one, one of the reasons that I called my first book Headscarves and Hymens was, was to emphasize the point that we're more than what's on our head and more than what's in between our legs because we're constantly stuck between these two really lazy paradigms, you know. And, and your book torpedoes through those lazy, lazy paradigms because some of the characters wear a headscarf sometimes and sometimes not. Some of the characters are like, I'm going to wait until I get married, but basically does everything but penetrative sex, but that involves a penis and a vagina. And some of the characters, you know, quite obviously says, you know what, fuck me all night. I don't care, but she doesn't drink. You know, so it's like this wonderful, complicated, you what now? Because, you know, the number of times people will look at me and say, I would never have guessed you're a Muslim because you know what they're guessing a Muslim looks like and therefore all the things that follow, you know? So tell me, tell us more about those very like in your face, it's about pleasure, it's about fucking, it's about bodies, it's about all of these things that you never associate with Muslim women. Right, and that was so important to me. And this, you know what, and I and this, I will say this, it follows on from the work that you've done, Mona. And I remember when your book, uh, when I first read it about why the Middle East needs a set, headscarf and hymens, why it needs a sexual revolution. And I remember being so profoundly moved by it because I remember thinking, yes, Yes, how can we talk about female power without talking about female pleasure? We can't have those, com those conversations need to happen in sync. And I remember having a conversation with my mum, who is, you know, an ardent feminist and raised me as an ardent feminist, but has very different ideas about sex than I do, right? And we both play out our Islam in, in hugely different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember my mum having an argument or having, we were having a conversation, she said something about Oh, you know, it's not about sex. It's about women accessing education and women accessing X, Y, Z, taking it to that. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, no, but you're wrong. It's you can't mm -hmm. take sex and pleasure out of this. And mm -hmm. I've always been profoundly moved by your work on it. And I've always been someone who wanted to talk about pleasure, mm -hmm. and sex, mm -hmm. and felt very natural to do so, despite not being raised in that environment. Um, mm -hmm. And for me. This was one of the, I was very intentional about making sure that the women in this book were going to feel pleasure. They were going to want pleasure. They were going to get pleasure and they would never feel guilty about it. I never wanted on the pages of this book to have the guilt conversation. You know, are you, do you feel guilty about it? Are you going to pray? Are you going to ask for forgiveness for your sins? We were never going to talk about sin and sex. Those words are not synonymous with each other. And I wanted these women to show um, a version of Islam that is lived out every single day around the world by different women. Because the thing that really frustrates me when we come to talk about Islam, and this is what, what you said about people assuming, how could you be Muslim, Mona? You don't look like what I think a Muslim woman is, right? Yeah. And my mom is, so she wears a, a headscarf and you know she covers her arms and her legs and then I will stand next to my mother with my hair out and in a mini skirt right mm -hmm. we both have such strong faith and we both believe in those core five pillars right mm -hmm. of Islam which Muslims all believe in but we play that faith out in different ways and what I've always been very annoyed and pissed off about is the lack of grace and leniency within faith communities for people mm -hmm. to play out their faith in different ways and this is not just specific to Islam. This is specific yes. Catholicism, Judaism, mm -hmm. Hinduism, across the board. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's always really frustrated me. And it's frustrated mm-hmm. me when I tell people I'm Muslim as well. They go, oh, really? But you swear or you have sex or you talk mm-hmm. about men. Or, and I think, and what's your point here? Why, why can't you expand your mind and know that faith and religion are not the same thing? And religion is often a tool to access faith. And some people use that tool more than others. And some people don't. And some people access that faith and have that personal relationship with their mother their maker or whoever they believe in in very different ways to other people and that's really beautiful and amazing mm-hmm. and why isn't that something that's welcomed and celebrated so I was very intentional I was going to portray women and all three women all of my protagonists they believe mm-hmm. they have faith deep in their heart and in their souls mm-hmm. and they love their faith and they never want to give it up but they're not going to apologize for going out and having sex or getting drunk or wearing a headscarf sometimes or not, or they're not going to apologize or restrict themselves from what is fundamentally very human desires. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I was so, that's what I wanted to achieve with this as well. And you did wonderfully. I mean, you start the book with one of the characters, Jenna asking, um, is eat sex a thing? Like, you know, like birthday sex. I mean, like if people don't understand where you're going to take them from that opening line, then, you know, they're, they're dim, okay? <laughs> so and you know, I was, I was at a book signing and a couple were, were asking me to sign their books. And then afterwards they were engaged. And afterwards the guy turned around to me and he said, eat sex is totally a thing. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, because it, I mean, it speaks to the fact that once you speak it, people... Uh, like we'll tell you we've been so hungry for this because this is how we live because we're complicated because we're messy because we're hungry because we love to fuck because we are in our totality we are all of those things but for such a long time we were denied them and thereby denied our humanity this is what I think is so wonderful about your message about how you know you spent your the whole time while you were researching your master's thesis going where are Muslim women and the fact that you couldn't find them means that we were denied our humanity. 100% and when when you deny our humanity you keep us in the shadows we never get to have a voice we never get to be considered real enough to to be granted the full swathe of human emotions and when you do not grant someone all of their human emotions they are less than they are not entitled to a voice and I find that that's so frustrating and I think as well the lack of honesty around it you know around those human emotions that we all feel you can take you can bring me the most religious person in the world they want to fuck as well, you know, and I remember (laughs) writing something about this and I said, and I've had this for years because I openly talk about sex. So many people, Muslims included, will, will message me um, and send me messages on Instagram, calling me all manner of names and saying that I'm not a real Muslim and I'm not entitled to be in the faith and just stop calling myself Muslim. If you could just take it out of your bio, then it will be fine. Then talk about anything you like, but just please take them out of your bio. You know, there's this real nervous insistence and I remember writing something on my Instagram and I said, all these people sliding in and telling me, you know, that and pointing scarlet letters at me and pointing the finger. And I said, and do you know what? They all fuck the same way I do on a Friday night. The only difference is I am willing to talk about it in the light instead of hide it in the shadows. That is the only difference. Do not ever assume that it's not happening across faith communities because it is. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And, the, and you highlight the hypocrisy several times in the book, you know, where you talk about how some things are allowed for the men and other things are, aren't allowed for the women and the characters. I, I mean, I, th- there was a situation I also don't want, you know, to give spoilers, but at one point, Peace brings it up with her family, you know, during a particular traumatic time where she says to them, you know, uncle so-and-so was able to do X, Y, and Z, and here I am, and, and you're giving me a hard time for it. And I think, and in those silences that you talk about is where the real damage happens. And this is why it's so important to speak as well, because in silence, shame and taboo, you you can bet, you know, a thousand percent that the most vulnerable and the most marginalized will be the most hurt. And in every society across the world, because patriarchy is universal, it will be women, girls and queer people, because we are the ones that are marginalized and pushed into those cracks of silence, shame, and taboo. And you show that in the book as well. And this is where female friendship really does become the savior. It's not, they're not waiting for men to save them. It's women saving themselves. But why was it important to you to show, um, you you said you didn't want to talk about guilt, 
but you bring up some really difficult things like intimate partner violence, like sexual assault, like, you know, some very obviously things that happen in every community, not specifically to our Muslim community. But why was it important for you in a book that celebrates pleasure and being hungry and go out and going out in the world that um, you brought in these diff so-called difficult topics? Do you know what? I, I think when those difficult topics happen to women as they do every day, unfortunately, when they when they happen, because they are so awful and so traumatic, I often find that it can push women in one of two, di two directions, you know? And it can push a, a real desire to fight and to kick back and to reject. And it can also push into so many harmful, dangerous situations as well. And it can result, as I'm sure it has for so many women and those women losing themselves for years mm. at a time. And, I wanted to include that because I wanted to show the very difficult realities of women and how other women do help helps help save them, but also mm -hmm. saviors as well. Mm -hmm. And I remember my friend, one of my close friends, read this before it went to publication, and she said to me afterwards, she went, "Oh God, you really put these women through it." Mm -hmm. And I and I looked at her and I said, "Yeah, but haven't we all gone through it?" And she said, yeah, well, that's true. And mm -hmm. I'm writing a story about female experience. And I mm -hmm. think personally, it would be remiss of me to mm -hmm. ever write a story about a female experience and not include the pain and the trauma that comes with mm -hmm. the female experience, like mm -hmm. sexual violence and intimate uh, violence from a partner, domestic mm -hmm. violence, abuse, because those things, when you look at the data and the statistics are so overwhelmingly strong and they happen to so many of us that how could I talk about the female experience with, without including that? I was never yeah. gonna show it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so glad you did because, because I know that the temptation for some people to try to move away from these so-called stereotypes, you know, in which we're locked um, is to too often sugarcoat it. I mean, I, I often tell people, I feel that my work is basically um, caught between a rock and a hard place where the rock are, you know, these racist Islamophobes who themselves are, of course, are misogynists, right? And who want to use my words against the Muslim community and say, look, you see, even Mona says, you know, the men treat the women badly. Yeah. And then the hard place is the Muslim communities, plural, right? Who yeah. are the misogynists, especially, but, you know, include some of the women too want to shut me up because they're like, you're just giving ammunition to the racists and the Islamophobes. And at yeah. the end, it just becomes this shouting match between the rock and the hard place over our bodies, like, you know, literally where, and we have no voice and I'm like, fuck you and fuck you because I'm never going to ally yeah. with the racists and Islamophobes and I will yeah. not shut up, you know, to appease, you know, the communities. So, I mean, it's like walking into a fucking minefield. How did you clear these voices while you were working? I know, and I, oh God, I feel that so deeply, Mona. I really feel that it is so tremendously difficult and I'm exactly the same as you. I'm never gonna, gonna side with, you know, all the communities who are saying, look how bad the Muslim communities are, look how oppressive you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm never gonna keep my mouth shut like the Muslim community would love me to do. Mm -hmm. um, because I am making it difficult, right? And they would rather I just refuse to acknowledge Islam and refuse to claim it because then it, it would make it easier because I would be, in the background and I wouldn't have they wouldn't have to deal with me right um mm. but the, the, you know I I have one rule for writing and only one rule and that is you never write for anybody but yourself and the minute when you are writing the minute you go oh what will my mum think of this sentence mm. what will the the auntie in the local mosque think of this or mm. what if my boss this, what will my boss think or my partner what if my partner reads this what will they think of it the minute you are then considering that you're no longer writing for yourself. You are writing for, for everyone else. So I'm, that's my only rule of writing. And I am very diligent about it. So when I am putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, those people are not in my head at all. I am writing what is true for me. And what is true for me is that the communities outside of the Muslim communities, the white communities, um, will do their best to silence me and to put me in a box somewhere. And the Muslim community will also do their best to mm. do that as well and mm. my silence does not serve anyone mm. and because what I learned many many years ago is that I could play the part that they want both sides want me to I could play it perfectly mm. and I have done on on the mm. instant and they will not love you more for it and mm. you can bend your spine uh mm. cleaning 
do and you can bend over backwards for those various groups and they will still not accept you and you will still mm -hmm. be the black sheep or the outsider or the whatever um, and no one is going to love you more for it so I thought well you're not going to like me anymore so you may as well just not like me fully and I will fully be myself and fully talk yeah. about the things that I, I think are important to talk about and also what I will say is I am invested in change I am invested in making life better for the women built who come after me I'm invested in this life being a little bit softer for Arab Muslim women who come mm. after me so how could I stay silent and then at the end of my life think that I did anything of any use for the women who came who come after me so yeah the rock and a hard place but I'm there with you and we'll make the soft place in the middle a little bit a little bit <laughs> absolutely together saying fuck you and fuck you to both the rock and the hard place I'm <laughs> delighted to be in your company Salma <laughs> And, you know, I watched, um, you gave um, a, a TED talk, a TEDx Peckham talk about, about this, you know, about, uh, kind of about this, right? About stories and, and how damaging and harmful it is to be allowed only one story. And um, yeah, so tell us a bit more about that, because I think it really ties into that, because that's what these two sides want. They, they want only one story from you. They want that, you know, oh my God, Muslims have been so bad to me. Or, oh my God, I'm such a proud Muslim, I will never say a bad thing. And you're saying, you know what? I'm a complicated person because we all are, and I deserve more than one story. So tell me about the importance of stories, plural. Yeah, and it's easier, isn't it, if we just present one story? It's, it's, it's packaged easier, everyone can understand <laughs> it better, and nuance is not something, especially in our modern world, we like to grapple with. Mm. Um, and, and I understand why people want it. And in my talk, I reference where this idea came from, which is, of course, from the wonderful writer and feminist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who gave an incredible talk about the danger of a single story. And I remember listening to her words and reflecting upon my own life and reflecting on the, the, the stories that I had tried to enact. You know, I said to you, I, I've tried to be what they wanted to, me to be mm -hmm. on both sides. And just how dangerous it is mm -hmm. for women to buy into those single stories and to live them out. And I think, to you know, people have done it. People have done it when they're younger, when they're older. People learn, mm -hmm. people, you know. And also we're all products of our environment. So sometimes you're sucked in, into a single story from the habits around you of your culture, of mm -hmm. your society, and you have to actively work hard to step outside of it. But mm -hmm. you know, I followed a single story once upon a time. I did what mm -hmm. the, the Muslim community wanted me to do. And I ended up with, you know, the Egyptian Muslim man who prayed five times a day and on paper was perfect and all the aunties in the mosque could smile and my mum could talk about him with pride and say you know she's with a Muslim and I did I did that I did what I did what they wanted me to do um and it was the worst experience of of my life it was abusive he was abusive he broke me into so many pieces that to this day I still try to find the pieces to put them back together and I remember um, one night in, in that relationship that got particularly bad and was awful. And, and I remember sitting there with blood dripping down my face and he had left mm. the apartment. And I remember, you know, and you know what I thought in that moment? I remember thinking, well, where are they now? The Muslim community that wanted this for me, that mm. said this is what I was supposed to do. Mm. Where the fuck are you now? Because mm -hmm. you're not here to help me. You're not here to stop him. You're not here to witness this. You're not here when, when the red flag started to, to appear and you didn't guide me out of them. Mm -hmm. I am here because of you. And it has broken me. And this man that you want me to be with because you said I need to be with a Muslim and he prays five times a day. And I don't know if God will ever forgive him for some of the things that he did to me. Mm -hmm. So where are you now? You know, and I've had such anger at that for so long. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being so overwhelmingly pissed off about mm -hmm. it and, and realizing that that single story that I also had bought into and played mm -hmm. along with brought me to that point where I was sitting there with blood dripping down my face, wondering, mm -hmm. I am completely alone. Um, and I just remember thinking, well, I'm never fucking doing that again. You know, the, those single stories are incredibly yes. dangerous. And what, did, and what did it get me, you know? Yeah. And it didn't make anyone happier. No. So, um, yeah, and, and, and that's why I really wanted to talk about that in my TED Talk about, you know, mm. the single 
stories that we follow, you know, and you can follow it for years, by the way, you can follow it for mm -hmm. decades. Um, and I just think when, when death comes to take my hand, mm -hmm. will I be proud of the life that I lived if I did it for everyone else? Mm -hmm. And what's so ironic is we have every song in our popular culture and every movie and every bit of entertainment that we have tells us, do it your way. We literally have a song called, I did it my way, you know? <laughs> And yet, you know, when people try to step out of those single stories, they are damned and they are criticized. And so mm. I just, and this goes back to your point about what, what is bred in the silence. Mm. And so I, I, years ago, stepped outside of those single stories. And mm. I keep talking about stepping outside of those single stories in the hope that it will embolden or at least give someone the courage to step a little closer to their own story and a little further away from the single stories that are so dangerous. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, and Salma. I'm I'm saddened and enraged that that happened to you. But your willingness to talk about it and you know and to name it for what it is, um, is so important because I, I believe that a fundamental pillar of our writing, if it is to change the world, and I know that we're both here to change the world, is risk. Is that mm -hmm. taking a risk with your writing? Because when you take a risk with your writing, I mean, you don't know how you land, but you know you're exhilarated because you understand that you're doing something dangerous and necessary and it's through that danger and necessity that change happens and I think it happens on a fundamental level because I truly believe that the most subversive thing a woman can do is to talk about her life as if it really matters because mm. it does because women regardless of our background are constantly told our lives don't matter that yeah. you know it's someone else's story like we were talking about Rami and Mo and all these other yeah. stories you know our men always get their chance in the in the limelight way before we do well we're yeah. important too and that risk that you take is so important because it shakes people into awareness but then it also terrifies them and that's when they write to you and say take Muslim out of your bio because they you're just like oh my god because you know you're forcing them now to confront all of the one stories that they have now surrendered to right, right? A hundred percent. And when they do message me that I don't take it personally, I don't get upset. I just go, OK, if I have written something that has stirred something in you to the extent that you have to message me about it, I have done my job. That's it. My job. If if I have written something and you are completely apathetic about it, I have failed. But I've done my job. And this might be stage uh, one of 14 steps that you get to where you begin to question or change your perspective. And if I'm one of those steps, then then I've done my work here, you know, but it is about risk taking. Look at the risks that you've taken in your work, Mona, with the stories that you have shared, have enabled, literally have enabled women like me to then take those same risks and to live in those footsteps, you know, and it, and that's exactly what I think. I'm like, well, if I'm not honest about my experiences, how will other women come after me, which I'm sure you've had that thought process. And this goes back to Nana's book when she mm. said, you, know, you want to be anonymous. I thought, well, no, how, how can I, how can I be vocal about, we need to talk about pleasure and sex mm. and then not let you put my actual name to that chapter when we're talking about my sex life. No, like, yes, put my name to it. And, yeah. and let's hope that in doing so, we have swathes more women who yeah. put their name to it. I, I was so glad to see your, your name. I mean, I, I, I wrongly um, said earlier that the book is of various sexual and gender identities, but it's specifically women and trans women. And there, there are, um, I think, one or two non-binary people. But it's so important because it's those identities that are so often silenced. And, you know, um, the first book in, in the book club was a book called um, You're the Only One I've Told, The Stories Behind Abortion. And it was, it was um, again, oral narratives collected by Dr. Mira, Mira Shah, who, and you know, we had a great in-person event at the Strand and her book was one of those moments that you're talking about, about, you know, what do I want for people who are coming after me? Because um, her, she asked me to blurb the book and it was during lockdown of 2020. So I blurbed this wonderful book about, you know, these stories that people so often keep to themselves about abortion because of the stigma and the shame around it. Now, I told a few friends here and there that I'd had two abortions, but I'd never written about them. And here I am writing about this book and blubbing it and saying, when we tell our stories, it's a revolution. And I'm like looking at myself going, really, Mona? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and then I was like, and it just stayed in my head. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And yeah. then um, Safe Abortion Day came around. So th this was, I think, in March. And then like, it was, I think it took a year. And last year, Safe Abortion Day came around and it was obvious that Roe v. Wade was going to be revoked. And I was like, okay, you know what? There's something about courage that's like muscles, you know? If you don't, you know, when, when you start lifting weights, 
if you stick yeah. at the same like weight all the time, you're not gonna, you're not challenging yourself. You've got to lift heavier and heavier weights. So I was like, okay, look, I've done all the brave quote unquote things I've done. What now do I need to do? And obviously I need to write about my abortions. So yeah. I dared myself to finally write my, about my two abortions because I have to put my name and risk my, yeah. my stories because how else do you shake people into a revolution? Because that's what we want, right? A hundred percent. And I remember reading it in the newsletter when it came around, when you wrote about your abortions, being so thankful. I remember when I had my abortion and someone told me, someone said, it's the biggest club that you join that you never know about because there are so many women who have had them and who are silenced about it. And I spoke about it when Roe v. Wade went through uh, and was revoked. I was in New York at the time and I, I did a video on my Instagram about it and I spoke about my abortion and I'd never spoken about it before. And I had the similar thing to you, you know, I can talk about sex and abuse and assault and all the things that I've gone through, but this was kind of the final frontier that I hadn't, I hadn't addressed because people have so many wildly different personal and political mm -hmm. triggers to it. So I'd always just thought, let it go, don't say anything, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was something that my, my own family didn't even know about, you know? And, you know, that was, I was like, well, if I talk about it publicly, my mom will know about it and it will break her, mm -hmm. break her heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And when my mom, and I'm not gonna give any spoilers here, my mom read the book before it went to publication. Mm -hmm. She said at the end, I've only got one question for you. She said, did you have an abortion? And I never told her and I never wanted to and I mm. was never going to and I didn't intend to and I was never going to talk about it publicly so it didn't matter. And I remember in that moment that she asked me, I thought, well, there comes a point in your life where it's stupid to lie because everyone knows that it would be a lie. And I just mm. looked at her and I said, yes, yes, I did. Mm. And she asked me who was when and I told her. And the most heartbreaking thing about it is she said, and I never told her because I was, so afraid of her reaction and I in my mm -hmm. head you know she's been pretty anti-abortion I think mm -hmm. where that came from I don't know um mm -hmm. and and the most heartbreaking thing was is she, I told her and she said I wish you told me so I could have gone with you and I could have been there oh. Oh. Mm. right and I just thought I know. things that we lose mm -hmm. from not talking about mm -hmm. those stories and the fear that we encase around ourselves mm -hmm. and the judgments that we make on other people that are not fair that we're not also giving them the opportunity like if I had gone to my mom when I was pregnant I'm sure she would have wanted me to keep it regardless mm -hmm. of my I'm sure she would have wanted I'm sure she would have helped as well mm -hmm. but also I didn't give her the opportunity to be compassionate and full of grace and there for me because yeah. I had made my own judgments about it as well. So the things that we lose in those silences are devastating. And actually the bravery of you to write about it and to come out and think, finally, I'm going to talk about it is so enormous that you just can't even take it for granted how enormous it is and what it does for other women. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, we all, you know, we lift each other, um, Salma, you know, we talk about shoulders and we stand on each other. It's, we're kind of like doing circus acrobatics where one day you stand on my shoulder and the next day I stand on your shoulder because that's what it's like. Because one of the, um, other than, you know, realizing that I was calling this book revolutionary, but not talking about my own abortions, a real kind of like a reason that I decided to share my own abortions was that three of the women who Dr. Shah had mentioned in her book were South Asian women of Muslim descent. And they said how difficult it was when they were going through their abortion, that they never saw anyone who looks like them or came mm -hmm. from their faith background talking publicly about abortion. And I was like, yeah. my God, the loneliness of that experience. Because, yeah. because like your book, you know, and this isn't just about abortion now, this is about romance and fucking and drinking and partying and abortions and just living. We don't see enough women who look like us you know, yeah. being the stars of these shows, because, you know, like you told Vogue Arabia, you want to write Arab and Muslim women into literature, doing all of those things, because we've been lonely for so long. And, you know, Jenna talks about loneliness in, in the book, because we don't see ourselves reflected back. We don't see women having abortion who look like us. We don't see women having sex who look like us, all of that. So it, like I said, we like, we perform these acrobatics because I'm like, go, go, go Salma. Yes. Write us in there. And like, you're like, go, go, go Mona. Talk yeah. about your abortion, you know, because we, we've had such few experiences of going, that's me. Yeah, exactly. And one of my ethos is 
we rise as one. And I believe that so deeply, none of us are getting there by ourselves. And I don't want to either. I don't, that's, I don't want to be the only woman at the table, the only woman in the room, you know, we rise as one, which is why, you know, I, I meet women and I say, if there's ever anything I can do for you yes. on your journey, my resources, my networks, they're at your disposal, because let me take anything that I have that's going to help you on your journey and, and let's get you there. And I have yeah. women doing the same for me because we rise as one. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And we had a conversation like that when, so we last met, well, it was the first time we met in real life at the Bradford Literature Festival in uh, over the summer, June, July. And we were in the green room and we were talking uh, with Saima Mir, the author of The Khan. And, you know, here you are, two British women of Muslim descent who have had, you know, their debut novels recently come out. And um, you were talking, I remember, about the challenges of a publishing world. Now, I write nonfiction, you both um, in those, um, uh, for the novels, obviously fiction, but the challenges of being a brown woman, you know, someone who's not white, in a very white publishing world are real, aren't they? Yeah, they're really difficult and it's a, it's a tricky space to navigate. And, you know, publishing is white dominated, right? And also, if we're talking about publishing in the UK, there's a lot of literary snobbery that come from having the literary canon, you know, of Austen and Shakespeare and Dickens, and that just weighs everything down. Um, mm. And while there is, you know, you would think that the the events of summer 2020 and the murder of George Floyd and the sudden awareness that everyone had, you would have thought that would have done something, but actually what it's done is personally, I this is just my view, has created a lot of nervousness and a desire to put these black and brown people in these black and brown boxes. And, you know, I remember talking to my, my team and saying, you know, talking to the publicity team and saying, this is not a Muslim novel. This is not a novel about brown folks. This is not something that we market to people who are going through a list of 15 books to read to become more aware of black and brown people. Or, you know, 15 books to read if you're trying mm -hmm. to dismantle your whiteness. You know, mm -hmm. this is not a, a book that we market to those people. This mm -hmm. is universal. This is a story about women in the same way, dealing with all the things that everyone in this room right now has dealt with or are dealing with. Do not market this for that niche audience, mm -hmm. for the people who are trying to be woke, right? Don't do that. Market it as a universal thing. And there is a real, I don't know, hesitancy, they, they, mm -hmm. they don't know how to do it yet. So there's still a nervousness. If they don't know how to do it, they don't want to touch it because they're scared of getting canceled and of getting it wrong mm -hmm. and of the mm -hmm. Twitter backlash. There's a lack of bravery and courage. So it's still, it's still difficult. Yeah. But you know, if we spent years reading books that feature mostly, you know, white characters as their protagonists, it's about fucking time to feature characters that look like us and have everyone else who doesn't look like us read books yeah. about people who look like us, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it's about damn time as Lizzo says <laughs> it is about damn time and you know what there's so much of the feedback that I've got from the book you know from white women I I never would have picked this up uh and I didn't expect to resonate as much as I did but I totally resonated with everything in it and I'm like right okay it's what I've been saying because it's human right and and, and I think I'm going to take it to questions now because I I mean I could talk to you forever but there are people here who have questions for you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go through um, like one or two questions together, Salma, so that we can get them yeah. mostly done, okay? Yeah. So what advice, do, what advice do Mona and Salma have for women writers? So that's one, and that is from Anonymous. And then we have Wafa or Wafa. How to reach out to Mona and Salma. I would love, love, love to have a conversation with each of them at Hypatia for Gender Justice Conversations, a radical feminist, Arabic speaking, emerging organization, please their books make a huge part of our framework at Hypatia, yet in the local language of Mina. Oh, okay, this sounds very interesting. And then we have um, a question from Noor. I'm a Muslim young woman in Canada. I find it incredibly hard to reconcile the version of myself that I present to my family back home and my authentic self that's straying further away from the harmful Arab norms. How do I bring those two worlds together a little closer? So let's take those first two um, questions, the, the advice to women writers, Salma, and what do you do, what's your advice to someone who feels like she has to compartmentalize her life or lead a double life, so to speak? Um, so advice for female writers, oh God, Mona, you're gonna have loads on this because you've published so much more and have so many great insights on that. Um, but my advice for, for women writers, and I think is my advice for writers across the board as well is, 
that you need to write and publish, whether that's you're starting to do that. And I'm not saying you need to write and then get a publishing deal because that's quite a fairy tale that doesn't always happen. Um, but I think you become a better writer by writing and showing your work, writing and showing your work, whether that's in a newsletter to your family, whether that's in a newsletter mm -hmm. to a wider audience on your social media, there has to be some level of accountability, I believe, for your work to, to grow and get better. So always, definitely always do that. And then uh, from the aspect of like being a, a, a woman and identifying as being a woman and the, the gender complications that come in an industry that weirdly is female dominated, except at a senior level, riddle me that. Mm -hmm. um, then I think is be brazen and keep knocking down the doors because you're not going to get any publishing deals or you're not going to get anywhere by being polite mm -hmm. um, and have the confidence of a mediocre white man when you go to do that <laughs> and bring that with your whole chest when you pitch your work to um, to, to agents and to publishing houses. Don't be, I think you might like this because, and maybe if it's not too much trouble, I apologize for the inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Take all the apologies out of your mouth and pitch it with with conviction. That's what I would say. I don't, I don't know. What about you? No, I love all your advice. And I would much rather they hear from you, Salma. If there's time, I'll tip in a bit. But um, <laughs> um, Noor's question about um, leading a double life or compartmentalizing your life outside and your life at home. How would you tackle that one? Um, at first, I would question how exactly you you want to reconcile them because I think there is a narrative in the western world that your parents will love you no matter what and that you should just be able to be your whole self and tell them everything right which I don't necessarily think is true and I think we because if it's dangerous to you don't ever do it you know um I think one of you said something similar along these lines when about coming out as well you know mm -hmm. and if it's like that's going to put you in harm's way then never do it uh, ever um mm -hmm. So I think there is this quite this Hollywood narrative as well that is perpetuated of you can be your whole self and everyone has to love you for that. But actually, the truth is we are not the same person when we step into different situations. I am not the same person when I go home to my family because I present a different version. I'm not the same person when I'm with my most closest circle because I mm -hmm. like my chosen family because I present a different version. I present a different version when I am you know, in the workplace. So I think the idea of like, you're gonna reconcile everything and bring it together under this one umbrella is a little idealistic and I blame Hollywood for it. Um, but I, I think there is a balance to be struck Nord, between, you know, how you can bring bring things a little bit closer. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to what I said earlier about, you know, you can play the game and no one is gonna love you more for it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think for that is, you know, pick the, pick the fights that you wanna have and you don't have to conquer everything and it doesn't have to happen all at once. And, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't all at once go from, you know, the young, the young woman that lived with my parents to the woman that I am today. And, you know, mm -hmm. my parents knowing everything that I got up to, it came over years mm -hmm. and it came mm -hmm. over the right moments and the right conversation. Mm -hmm. So give it, give it time and be patient um, with that. Cause it will, it will come, but also, you know, they don't I I don't know what your family situation is like but for me I have a lot of grace for my parents as well um and so I respect and appreciate the things that they live by and how they live by and I live by those rules when I'm with them because I don't think that they should force their life down my throat so I don't think I should force my lifestyle down their throat either and there's a mutual respect there so I think it's about finding that balance. Thank you, Salma. And I think I just want to tell Wafa, who was um, asking us about the Hypatia um, the Center for Gender um, Justice Conversations, to contact us through um, Instagram and we'll see what we can do, because I think that would be the best way to kind of start that conversation. And I have um, an, another question for you, Salma, from an, another anonymous attendee. This is incredibly amazing, and I'm so happy for you being able to emancipate yourself and set yourself free. And I really wish that for those of us who do not have the ability and resources to do that for ourselves. My heart goes out to us all. Uh, that's a comment rather than a question. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Uh, attendee. And my heart goes out to everyone as well. I I'm sure you would second that sentiment, Salma. Um, another anonymous attendee says, um, asks rather, how would you advise women who are trapped and defenseless and numb and dejected? That's a big question. And without context, quite a difficult one to answer because I can't just give generic advice, right? Because like I said earlier, depending on what situation you're in, you, you do need to keep yourself safe as well. And you need to, and I don't know what 
I, I mean, if you want to message me later on Instagram, please do, um, because I don't know what your actual situation is. Um, but I think generically, I'll try and answer a little bit generically, but generically, I think women can get quite numb and dejected because when you're following mm -hmm. a world that wants you to be a certain thing constantly, it becomes really, really difficult. My advice would be surround yourself with women, surround yourself with women who think like you women who believe in the things that you believe in because they will help you save yourself and they will save you as well you know women the women in my life have been the greatest loves of my life and I am only mm -hmm. the woman I am today by proxy of the women mm -hmm. I've had around me so surround mm -hmm. yourself I love that thank you Salma so I've got a couple more questions for you this is from Lara who says Salma, this book was so exquisitely written I took 16 pages of notes on the beautiful phrases language uh, we've exchanged DMs already about this. I would love to know how you are similar to each of the three main female characters and also how did you dream them up and grow them in your mind? And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the final question, Salma, and then you can like remember that one. And the final question is from another Noor, Noor Morjan. Hi, Noor. I, I know no because we we talk on Instagram first I want to thank you both for this wonderful talk I can relate to all of it and I'm so happy I'm getting to know more and more about women who are letting our existence have an echo in this society through my experience when people find out I'm a Muslim and I don't look like one especially when I declare that I drink I get identified as a as bad automatically or as a bad Muslim automatically how do we fight these two battles with the white community and the Muslim community being judged from them is damaging Thank you for that question, Noor. And, and those two questions are clear, right, Salma? Yes, absolutely. Noor, you can get into the, the hard space between the rock and the hard space that Munna and I are sitting in for that. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll scream to both sides. Um, I'll go to Lara's question first. Uh, thank you so much. And that's so beautiful that um, you would find the book well written. It is, that's all I wanted from it. So that's so lovely to know. I'm really humbled. Um, I, there's a little bit of me in all of the characters. Uh, there's a little bit of my two best girlfriends I grew up with in, in our Muslim community in all of the characters. There's like strangers that I've seen on the, on the train with their weird quirks. Some of that is in <laughs> all of the characters. Um, I, but very quickly, I am probably as sarcastic as Keith. All of Keith's sarcasm is, mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty. I have quite a cutting tongue, as I've been told many a time <laughs> by my family. Um, so there's there's a lot of that in there. Um, and there's a lot of kind of Malak's hope and earnestness I have in me as well from a younger me. And, and uh, some of them are kind of me when I was younger and me in the future and me what I would have wished to be, you know. So there's there's a little bit of all of me. If any writer tells you that there's none of themselves in their fiction <laughs> character, they're lying to you and never believe that. Um, and nor as for your question, well, you heard Mona and I both struggle on, on what we do in that I think it's again it's a little bit about picking those battles you know and I get exactly the same you know when people I remember I said something recently that you know oftentimes when I can't sleep I will put Quran on and I have a playlist of Quran and I play it out and I find it very very soothing and it helps me to sleep um and I remember that came up in conversation and and someone turned around to me and went I just I think it was my sister-in-law so someone like pretty close um that I didn't realize you were so religious and then I was like, well, what do you want me to say? Like, I don't identify as so religious, you know, I just have faith that I believe in it. And because I was out here having sex, you know, you thought that I didn't, you made that assumption, not me. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I no, I really understand that. And I get it as well. I think you don't always have to fight the battles, right? Like my sister-in-law said that. And I just went, well, yeah, I've always been and moved on. You know, I wasn't going to fight that battle because I didn't think it was a, a worthy of, of my energy at that point mm -hmm. in time. Um, so I think it's a little bit about picking those battles um, and who you want to have those conversations with. You know, I've had white people in workplaces be really surprised when they found out I didn't drink or had never drunk alcohol um, because I was talking about how I got laid the night before. And then they're like, oh, wait, 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 wait I can't commute that. If you're, if you're going to go around getting a lot of dick, then why don't you get drunk? With them? You know, that makes sense in my head. Um, and there's there's times where I thought, if I have this conversation with you about the complexities and the nuances of me and my faith, is it going to sink in? Is it is this fertile soil for me to have this conversation? Mm. Sometimes it's not. And I just think, no, you're half drunk already. And this you, you, you're so bigoted <laughs> and full of misogyny that this is not going to land well. You are not worthy of my energy on this. So pick your battles, Noor. There are times when these conversations 
need to be had and can be had but there are times when you're screaming into the ether and I think the hardest part of it is knowing which is which and when to have those conversations so scream scream there are times to scream and put your finger up and uh, everyone but there are times where you think not today we need to well beautifully it. said Salma thank <laughs> you thank you and before we wrap up because I know Elena's going to come in soon and wrap us up is there anything you would like people to watch, to do, to follow, to buy, to listen to? Do you have a podcast? Is there a newsletter? Is there a show? Tell us, promote something. <laughs> um, I have a Patreon, which is always a good place to, to go if you want. And I have a weekly newsletter that comes out every Tuesday. Um, and that's always a wonderful space. There's different tiers. I have a something called a womb circle. And every second week we come together in a Zoom and we all share our experiences or discuss something that we're struggling with. This week we did it on um, beauty standards and surgical changes to bodies and and the feminist rhetoric around that. So it's all different things. So that is always a beautiful way to support me because you don't make that much money. You don't make any money writing books, okay? There's, there's no money in it. There's absolutely not in it, I'm gonna be honest with you. So if you wanna be a writer, do it because it's the only thing that will let you breathe better at night, which is why I do it. There's no money in it. So that is always a beautiful way to support me. You can follow me on all of the socials as well. And what I will say is, if you're gonna sign up to my newsletter, you should absolutely also sign up to Munna's. There is a free version and a paid version because Munna's newsletter that comes every week is incredible. Thank yes. you, Salma Habibti. It is so wonderful to speak to you. Thank you, Elena. Over to you now. <laughs> I just, I was going to echo my thanks as well. Thank you so much both for a fantastic conversation. So enlightening, so wonderful. Um, if you haven't purchased it yet, the link is in the chat for these impossible things. Please, it is excellent. Um, we also have Mona's books in there as well. There's one. The other one is in the chat as well. Um, that's it. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Amuna, thank you so much. Haritzi Elbi. Thank you. And fuck the patriarchy, everyone. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.